gives me great pleasure to introduce Ian Onstadt um, uh, as our first speaker this afternoon, um, who from milking technology point of view is, is someone that you've probably all uh, known of, uh, maybe not had the opportunity to hear talk. So this afternoon I'm delighted to introduce Ian, uh, who's talking about the optimizing of the uh, optimizing the milking system itself. So Ian, you're very welcome. Thank you for your time. Um, and the suggestion that Ian and I have got is that he'll talk maybe till about 10 to the hour, 10 to 3, and then take questions. But if there's anything burning, I'm sure you'll cover that as well. But uh, thank you very much, Ian. You're very welcome. Well, thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to everybody uh, this afternoon. Uh, I've got the envious task of flying the UK flag when I look at the other speakers that are on the agenda, so uh, I will do my best for the UK. Thankfully, I don't have to do my best for England when we look at our World Cup performance. <laughs> so the topic this morning, or this afternoon, optimization of the milking system. So what does that actually mean? So when I was asked to talk about the topic, I sat down and thought, well, actually, what, what do we mean by that? What, what are we trying to achieve and what are we trying to describe? Are we talking about milk output? And if we are, are we talking about cows per hour? Or are we talking about litres per hour? And, and everybody in this room will have a view on that. Or are we talking about optimising milk quality? Low levels of clinical mastitis, low somatic cell counts, low back to, back to scans. So is it, is it milk quality that's the, the optimisation? Or anybody who knows me knows I have <coughs> a fixation with post-milking cow's teat condition. So actually, are we interested in optimizing it from a teat condition perspective? But when we do any of this, we have to do this in the light of the amount of money we're willing to spend to achieve that. Whether we're looking to, to optimize our existing system or whether, whether we're actually looking to try and achieve something that's new. So can we have it all? Or, or is it like being married? It's, it's a compromise. Now, I spend a lot of time traveling, so I, I always like to have family pictures with me. So, so are we trying to achieve all of these things, or, or what are we actually trying to optimize? So do we want high throughputs? Do we want fantastic milk quality, or do we want superb teat condition? And the question to you is, can we achieve all three? So perhaps we should think about the size of the installation size of the machine. But we can't consider that without considering the work routine that we employ within that milking. But we also need to look at the machine. What can we do fundamentally to the milking equipment to make it more efficient? And let's not forget the key player in this whole discussion, which is the dairy cow. How do we make her fit into the system to optimize what we're doing? So if we start with the machine, we're talking to a, a bunch of sizable dairy farmers who I would imagine many of you will be having rotary milking parlors. <clears throat> so I make no apologies that, that the presentation is going to focus on large rotaries and large herring bones. And for anybody in the audience who has a small parlor, we can deal with that with one slide. But when we're talking about optimizing parlors, we need to be thinking about size. So if we look at efficient milking on a rotary, what is the throughput, whether it's cows per hour or liters per hour, what is the throughput determined by? <coughs> number of milking bales, number of stalls, quite clearly is a key driver to this. But what about rotation speed? How important is rotation speed? and the average cow milking time. So when you actually look at those three elements to rotary milking, each is as important as the other. So here's a snapshot of some typical dairy herd with typical cows. And, and anybody who's actually coming to this conference from a practical perspective will recognize that within their herd. You've got a significant number of cows who don't have teats, they have taps. They produce a large volume of milk in an incredibly short duration. But what we have is a fairly typical normal distribution, but with more of a tail towards slower milking. So if you look at this particular example, 
if you're looking at this particular herd, we're talking somewhere around about six minutes, typical unit on time for one milking to milk that cow. Now, if you happen to be rotating the parlour at just around 10 minutes, every cow to the right-hand side of the rotation time will be milked within one rotation. By definition, anything to the right-hand side is going to be recycled, so which either means she goes around again, or depending on the system you operate, the parlour may slow down to accommodate her until she's finished milking. But whichever, you, whichever system you utilise, you build in a degree of inefficiency by having the parlour rotating slower than the average unit on time. So if we think about the link between rotation time and bales, number of bales, and, and anybody who's had me on their farm knows that I probably one of my greatest attributes would not be considered to be mental mathematics. So when we start looking at some of these performance figures, we try to keep things fairly simple and fairly basic. So not surprisingly, if you have a rotation time of 10 minutes, that's 60, 600 seconds, that's all we have to play with for one full rotation of the platform. So if we're rotating a platform with 40 stalls or 40 bales in 10 minutes, we have 15 seconds per bale. That's the, only, that's the time allowed per task, per cow, 15 seconds. When we take that and apply that to a 60 bale rotary, that time comes down and it comes down to 10 seconds per bale. So we're now starting to put a little bit of pressure on the operator. So that task has to be achieved in 10 seconds, whether it's prepping, spraying, cupping. You have 10 seconds per task. When you go to a larger rotary and you go up to 80 bales, if you're still achieving a 10 minute rotation, you're down to seven and a half seconds per bale. Now I have very, very few people, in fact, I don't think I have anybody in the UK who I work with who consistently achieves seven and a half seconds per bale. But I do know of farms in the States where I've had some input where they can consistently achieve that. But just think about that, seven and a half seconds per task per cow for a six or seven hour milking stint. So where's the different labor different labor yeah because they they will see it more of they they are task specific yeah so they'll be cuppers or they'll be prepping or they'll be spraying so we start looking at this relationship between rotation speed bale size and routine time and and I apologize sometimes these slides don't come over as well as they should and you lose something when it goes from one laptop to the other but basically with these four types of bale you can see that the red cross is supposed to signify that 10 minute rotation. So if we set out to achieve rotation times of 10 minutes, you can see as the parlor or the bale size goes up or the rotary size increases, we start to make some fairly marked improvements in terms of throughputs. But the other thing that's very clear from that particular graph is irrespective of size of the rotary, if you can't start to achieve these quicker times per bale, there's very little benefit from having a larger rotary. So to really capture the benefit of a large rotary, we need to be moving to the right to quicker time per bale. So this shows us that the largest determinant of the throughput is rotation speed. And then rotation speed will drive the time per cow. And if we're achieving bale time of anywhere between 12 and 15 seconds or above, irrespective of the size of the rotary, by getting bigger or putting in a bigger rotary, you will not achieve any improvement in throughput. So if you're in the situation or in the circumstances of contemplating a rotary, you may not be milking in one currently, it's important that we look at the work routine very closely and we understand the effect of not getting that bale time down because otherwise we will not achieve what we set out to achieve. And obviously the rotation time is going to be driven, in many cases, by the slowest cows. Slow cows 
have incredibly detrimental effects on any parlor throughput. Okay, so how do we apply that same concept to a herringbone? Well, the two things that are going to determine performance through a herringbone, again, whether it's litres per hour or cows per hour, is going to be the number of milking points, surprise, surprise, milking time of the slowest animals, and the work routine. And the work routine becomes even more important when we start looking at herringbones with less labour often than a rotary because we're actually asking an operator to do more than one task, which often a rotary, they are very task specific. But we have the dilemma, don't we? Because you take a herringbone milking parlour, you can milk quickly, or you can produce quality milk, and it's back to the balance. It's that compromise. It's very difficult to achieve both. And, and I flippantly, when I have an opportunity to speak to dairy farmers, I'll flippantly make the comment that I don't believe there'll be many farms, when I speak at an evening meeting, there won't be many farms who I couldn't go on to that farm or their farm that afternoon and milk their cows quicker than they had. I'd be comfortable I could do that. I wouldn't want to sell the milk I produced afterwards, yeah. but I'll milk more quickly. So, so we understand this relationship between speed and thoroughness and quality. So the work routine, what, what do we mean by a work routine in a milking parlour? That's the tasks we need to do to successfully milk one cow. So we need to get her in. So she needs to be marshalled to the yard. She needs to be loaded into the parlour. We need to prepare her teats. We might be foaming, we might be pre-spraying, we might be using laundered cloths, we might be using paper towels. Hopefully there is some form of preparation going on. We then need to attach the cluster. We may need to remove the cluster if there's no ACRs fitted. Disinfect the teats and get the cows out. We might have to wash the standings. We might have to treat a bit of mastitis. And there's always some time that you can't attribute to a specific task. So all of that is time related to milk one cow. And it doesn't matter where in the world we go. There are 3,600 seconds in one hour. So if everything that we do to that one single cow requires 60 seconds of input, you can have a herringbone parlour with 24 milking points or 124. If the work routine is 60 seconds, you will never milk more than 60 cows in one hour. It's physically impossible. If we can look at the work routine, look to optimise it without compromising milk quality, perhaps get it down to 40 seconds per cow, we have the opportunity to lift throughputs to near 90 an hour. But you see how the work routine drives the milking performance. And in most cases, it's the work routine that limits the performance. It's not the number of available milking points. If we were sat in this conference 20 years ago, it would have been a different discussion. Because in many cases, the size of the parlour was limiting our potential efficiency. But these days, parlours are generally bigger and it's not the number of units that limits our performance. So what is the right size parlour? Thinking about a herringbone, what's the optimum number of units? Well, if we assume that the slowest milking cows are going to take about 10 minutes to milk out. So we've got about 600 seconds from cups on to cups off. If the work routine is 40 seconds for those cows, the optimum number of units to avoid unit idle time or operator idle time, the optimum number of units is 15 per operator. Any more than that or any less than that, we're not optimising it. If we put in less than 15 units with a work routine of 40 seconds, we've got the operator standing twiddling his thumbs. If we go much more than 15 units, we're having units hung up that are not being milked efficiently. So if we take an example of a 24 unit milking parlour, 24 milking points, work routine of 40 seconds, 960 seconds available per side. The slowest cows taking 600 seconds to milk, the number of units is not limiting our performance. It's those slow cows. So perhaps the issue is to address the slow cows. 
slow cows in herringbone parlours, significant problem, significant challenge. What about if we go for a smaller parlour? We were saying a 40 second work routine, 15 clusters is around about the right number. Take an example of a parlour with 12 clusters. So a small swing over herringbone, for example. So we've got 480 seconds available to do everything that we need to do with a 40 second work routine. But we've just established that the slowest cows are taking 600 seconds. We've now got some operator idle time. Cups are all on, there's nothing else we can do because we're waiting for these 600 second cows. And if you look at actually how much of effect that has, 10 seconds per cow. It can broadly equate to around about 10 seconds per cow. If you split that or add that to each of our cows, remember we had a 40 second work routine turning in around 90 cows an hour. You introduce the idle time of 10 seconds per cow, our work routine increases to 50 seconds, the performance now drops to 72 cows an hour. So having a parlour that's inadequately sized really drives performance downwards and there's very little you can do about it other than cutting into the routine. So, we don't want to adversely affect milk quality, but we want to milk more efficiently. So let's look at the routine and see what we can do to it, hopefully to improve it, bring the time per cow down, but without having an adverse effect on the actual milking performance and the milk quality. So, so let's look at the routine. Not many people milking cows actually spend time to look at their routine. The routine that's applied is the routine that they've adopted, developed, evolved over the time, rather than actually critically looking at the elements of it. And once you have looked at it and identified what you're doing, what do we compare it with? So how do we benchmark it? Are we slow in certain activities? Are we quick in certain activities? Identify the work routine. Identify the weaknesses within it. The other thing we could do, of course, is start thinking about playing around with our ACRs, reducing the takeoff times, so the 600 second cows become 400 seconds or 500 seconds. So bring the cups on time down by looking at, looking at the ACR thresholds. Or what we could do is talk about max T. And as I tried to explain to my daughters the other day, that is not some wrapper. Max T is actually maximum unit on time. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So, comparing and contrasting. This is a really simple exercise that I encourage as many of the people I work with to do as possible. It's something that we can do for clients, but actually, if you're a dairy farmer and you have some similar farms of similar uh, mentality in the area around you, it's something you can do as a group very, very simply. Just spend a couple of milkings watching somebody else work. And, and that is an incredibly rewarding thing to do. And look at where the time is going. Where are you actually spending your time when you're milking cows? So we broke this down into basically five very simple categories. And we've got four farms. There's nothing special about any of these farms. And we've got the four, five categories of cows in, so loading, combination of loading uh, and cow flow teat preparation, cups on, teat disinfection, cows out. Now, we haven't got time, nor have you got the, the interest to go through every single point in huge detail. But there's a snapshot from four typical dairy farms. If you were any one of those four farms, can you immediately identify something on one of your farms that you could look at that makes you considerably different to your neighbours? because I certainly could. And you say, if we just, we'll take one farm to deal with, we'll just look at farm number two. Loading, loading's fairly acceptable, just over six seconds. He's not the quickest, but he's certainly not the slowest. But look how long he's spending on teat preparation. Now, is that because he's incredibly methodical and incredibly thorough? Or is that because he has incredibly dirty cows? Dirty cows, drives performance, nothing to do with the machine, but drives performance. He's quite quick putting clusters on, 
possibly he's around average with his teat disinfection. I was a little surprised at um, how quickly some farms can disinfect teats. Now that raises a whole raft of other questions, of course. <coughs> and his cow loading, his cow unloading is the slowest of the lot. So I would be very interested to know how his cows leave the parlor, cow flow, cow management post-milking. Because you only need to be saving a few seconds in each of those elements before it has a marked effect on the performance. No, those are all herring bones. Yeah, so obviously, yeah, you need to compare like with like. So you can do it informally with a couple of farms within a discussion group. Obviously, the bigger the data set, the better. Alternatively, you can pay somebody to do it, and they'll do it in a lot more detail. I would have to confess, this is a data set that we've built up over the years, so it's a very robust data set. But the conclusions that anybody who does some work routine study on their farm will be the same whether they do it themselves or whether they use a bigger data set, as long as they're comparing it with a sufficient number of other farms. And again, if you just look at this as an example, compared to the particular farm compared to the benchmark figure, the one thing that leaps out at you is time required to prepare the cows. So we've identified some potential weaknesses within the system. Let's try and understand where that time is going. So we might be very interested in cow flow. Design of the collecting yard, use of the backing gate. Is it appropriate use of the backing gate? Trying to move 300 cows into a herringbone parlor with a backing gate at the back of 300 cows? That's not efficient use of a backing gate. Do we have good access into the parlor? Is it light and airy that encourages cows to move in? Have we got appropriate group sizes? If we've got a 20 unit parlor, multiples of 20 are incredibly helpful. It, it amazes me on many of the farms I go to, certainly during the winter when we're in a winter housing situation, halfway through a milking, two or three times during the milking, they'll milk half a side of cows. So having appropriate group sizes to meet the requirements of the parlor is very, very important. But this is the big bugbear, cow cleanliness, teat cleanliness. You will never milk quickly when cows are as the cow on the left. We should have cows being presented pristinely clean so that when we start to talk about teat preparation, we're talking about stimulation rather than cleaning dirty cows. So we could think about improving cleanliness by better cubicle management, better yard management, improved ventilation, reduction in humidity. We could talk about clipping tails. And every opportunity I get to speak to anybody who's a dairy farmer, I always talk about clipping tails because I have a vested interest in this and that somebody who spends a lot of time dynamically testing parlors, who's connected to a cluster by a piece of silicon pipe that's eight inches long. Her tail is longer than eight inches and I can't get away from a shitty tail. So I have a real interest, let alone the benefits of cow cleanliness. From my point of view, I have a real vested interest in ensuring that tails are clipped and clean. So do we go a stage further? <coughs> Clipping udders, singeing udders. If the udder doesn't have excessive amounts of hair on it, straw, shavings, and fecal material will not stick to it. And then we think about teat preparation. So I've already established that we're interested in preparing teats from a stimulation perspective. But obviously, the longer that you spend preparing a cow's teat, the greater the time per cow, the lower the potential throughputs. And what about unit repositioning? This might go under the class of miscellaneous. But we all want a cow's milking cluster to be positioned squarely underneath the cow. If it's not squarely underneath the cow, it won't milk out cleanly, and you'll get increased levels of liner slippage. And you'll be amazed how much time is wasted during a routine having to go back and reposition a cluster that's slipping or badly set up. So actually getting into the routine of attaching it correctly, which includes 
pulling the ACR cord fully out saves time later. And then cow exit. That farm that we discussed, farm number two, was twice as slow to exit cows. Maybe he had something like this. So cows should flow uninterrupted away from the machine. We shouldn't be waiting for cows to exit. I suppose we could also think about spending some money. <coughs> it's always a good solution, isn't it? So we want to try and replace some labor elements with some automation. So we might think about a farm whose, whose cow loading is a little bit on the slow side. So let's put in a backing gate and let's use it correctly. We may be feeding. Perhaps we're manually feeding with a control box at the entry position or punching cow numbers in. Let's think about automating that process so the cow is fed at the right time automatically, no labor input, no work routine requirement. Teak preparation, maybe we could think about some sort of whizzy brush. Maybe we could think about a system that doesn't require a pre-spray and a wipe. All of these are things that can save some time, but we have to consider it in the light of overall milk quality and mastitis levels. Teak disinfection, we could think about doing it with a spray gun or a dip cut. If we could automate that process, we'll save some time. What are the benefits? What are the pitfalls? <coughs> and then possibly shedding. Post-milking shedding. If you're standing waiting for 20 cows to exit, manually shedding them, that's time you're not using on another task. So it's dead time, your work routine is going up. So if we're going to spend some money, let's at least know what we're going to get for it. And this is uh, a little program that Dairyco have got on their, um, one of their uh, resources. And, and if you speak to Isaac, Isaac, I'm sure, will steer you towards this resource. This basically allows you to look at your current milking system. And, and as a Scotsman, this is the sort of software I like because it allows me to pretend to spend money. And what I can actually do is I can start to put in automation that doesn't currently exist on my parlor. And I know how long my milking is currently taking. I can add some automation, and it will recalculate my milking speed. So if I spend 10 grand on a backing gate, and it reduces my milking time by 45 minutes, I can now make a justified, fully aware appraisal of the benefit of that investment. If I spend 10 grand on a backing gate and it's going to save me <coughs> three minutes of milking, I'm in an informed position to actually justify that expenditure. So we also talked about the ACRs, adjusting the ACR. We're going to finish off in a few minutes talking about stimulating the cow. The most important thing to stress at this point is if we're thinking about touching the ACRs, particularly in terms of lifting thresholds, taking the units off more quickly or earlier to reducing the unit on time, we have to milk, make sure that cow is thoroughly stimulated <coughs> and properly prepared. Because if she isn't, we will under milk quarters and we will leave milk in the udder. So we have to have a well-stimulated cow before we can start to contemplate any of this. If you take the, th for twice a day milk herd, take the, the threshold from 200 to 400 grams as the switch point for the ACR. Typically, on average, that's going to take about 35 seconds off a cow milking. So we're talking about an average milking of six-ish, six minutes, six and a half minutes. By taking the ACRs from 200 to 400, potentially drop that to near six minutes. If we're milking three times a day, if we're happy with the routine, potentially go to 700 or in many cases more than 700 gram takeoffs. If we do that and we start to push thresholds up, we have to be sure that we've milked the cow correctly. So taking a sample of strip yields when you make these changes, making sure that we're not leaving more than 200 mil in the cow. If there's less than 200 mil, she's milked out. If there's more than 200 mil, we need to either look again at the takeoff setting or we need to look at the routine that preceded that. And this is some 
a concept is probably the best description that's being floated at the moment in New Zealand. Uh, and I've just come back from quite an interesting project down in New Zealand where they're, they're running a project called Milk Smart, which is basically looking to optimize the efficiency of milking parlors. And when you look at the Kiwi system, a lot of the elements of the work routine that we've just described don't really fit in that well. So the areas that they look to hone are beyond the work routine. And one of the areas that they've identified is this issue of max T. And you can see it very simply here. If you take your average time for the row of cows, of being, say, eight minutes, and we're talking about the typical milking of about six and a half minutes per cow, everything to the right, which were our returned rotation cows, recycled cows, you could just take the cups off them. Just set the ACR, just remove it. Now the sort of stony silence in the room is pretty much the stony silence that I faced when, when I first listened to this presentation in New Zealand. Because if you do that, these truncated or shortened or max T cows, surely they're gonna run into health problems. But we're not seeing that and we're looking at some for New Zealand standards, some reasonably high yielding herds. So these are cows that are actually fed properly and managed properly. And what we're, <laughs> just checking everyone was awake. So, so these truncated cows, when you actually look at the data, they adjust, they adjust to the system. They'll be doing somewhere about six, six and a half thousand liters. So we're not, nothing like the yields we're talking about here, but you could average, you could say average for the UK. So if max T is something that might be of interest to some farms, and it certainly, we, I have at the moment two clients that we're having this discussion with, because we can see real benefits in terms of lifting performance. What we have to first establish is, is how does your herd fit that distribution curve for unit on time? Most people don't know that. What is the shape of the curve? Where's the peak? And at what point might you consider truncating it? We're thinking that we would start at 90%. So the 10% of the herd that are the slowest milkers, we would target them first. But actually, we may lose our bottle. We may go for 95% and see what happens. But taking out those 5% of cows is likely to have quite a marked effect, particularly if you have a smaller parlor. So just finish off a little bit with the machine. What can we do to the physical bit machine itself? We all understand that to milk a cow we need vacuum. I'm hope, hoping that's not a point we need to debate. But if we have too much vacuum, we run into problems. And we know that vacuum is related to milking speed. And the reason we know that is I started my career in Somerset. And in Somerset, the particular area that I used to work in, Skittles evening was on a Thursday evening. And those guys would turn up the vacuum on a Thursday afternoon milking to get finished to go to Skittles on time on a Thursday evening. They understood the relationship between vacuum and milking speed. But we also understand the adverse effects of excessive vacuum. So we have to try and mitigate that. So if we apply excessive vacuum to a cow's teat for too long, the teat becomes swollen, becomes congested, it becomes discolored and it becomes uncomfortable. And the cow will slow down her milking. She won't milk out as quickly. Now when you look at what's happening to a cow's teat within a liner during the milking process, the reason we have pulsation is that the closing of the, pulse of the liner on the teat squeezes the teat, keeps the blood flowing and the circulation moving, the, the lymphatic liquid moving, so the teat does not become congested. So if we milk a machine, have a milking machine with unrelieved vacuum, we cannot milk a cow. We apply some compressive load from a liner, we squeeze the teat, we keep the circulatory fluids moving, we keep the teat in good condition. And you can see, as the liner closes, there's the liner fully open. This is a silicon pipe inserted up through the teat. 
So when the liner's fully open, you have a full milk flow. When the liner closes, so that's the right-hand picture, you can see the teat squeezes, the teat becomes compressed, but look how that silicon pipe is also compressed. So what you start to see is good compression from the liner. So we have to balance the amount of squeeze that the liner applies for how long it applies with the appropriate amount of vacuum. And so we start juggling pulsation and vacuum levels. And we know that as the B phase, this is the liner open phase where milk is flowing, as that increases in length, milk flow increases in length <coughs> to a point because suddenly we then have it expo the teat exposed to vacuum for too long during the B phase, we start to get the buildup of fluids and the teat canal starts to occlude. So we have to balance how long it's open for with the appropriate amount of vacuum. And you can see this. These are the four lines of four different periods of time that the liner is open, four different B phases with an increasing vacuum level on the bottom axes. And as your B phase starts to increase, when it gets up to 500 milliseconds, which is at the high end of what we typically see, the rate of increase in milk flow starts to decline. And then we actually start to get a reduction in milk flow. And that's because the compressive squeezing effect of the liner is insufficient to relieve the congestion caused by the vacuum and the time it's exposed to the teat. And this has led to the development of liner performance maps. And this is something I've been working with Doug Reinemann from the University of Wisconsin now. We've been working on this for about three years. And each of these maps is specific to a particular liner. And what it allows us to do is look at how we assess the pulsation so the B phase across the top, with the vacuum in the claw at peak milk flow. Now this goes back to the question I asked at the beginning. What are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to achieve fast milking, high throughputs, or superb teat condition? With a liner map, we can achieve both, but we can make an informed decision as to what we want to achieve. So the percentage figures are the percentage of maximum milking speed. The colours in the typical traffic light system indicate the risk of teat congestion. So you can see the general trend as you move across to B phase increasing, so in other words, the liner is open for longer. As the B phase increases and the vacuum level increases, you do get a shift towards faster milking, but you also get quite marked change in the colour. So in other words, the risk of teat congestion increases. So this is a specific map for a specific liner. And we have about eight of these for different liners. And they're all different shapes and colours. So they all behave differently. And we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow morning. But what you can suddenly see is you can actually now set a system up to balance B phase and vacuum, knowing what milking speed we're going to achieve but also knowing what the outcome will be in terms of teat condition post-milking. So the other things we could think about, this is all basic stuff that we should all know, but nevertheless, we're not very good at getting right. So having air bleeds free, having pipes that aren't kinked and that are reducing milk flow, having liners that aren't worn, having short pulse tubes that are not perished and not giving a crisp, clean pulsation signal, routine maintenance. Milk tube length, we've already said that milk flow is driven by vacuum. If we have excessively long, long milk tubes, we get, in, we get a large induced vacuum drop from the system to the claw. By reducing the length of the tube to an appropriate level, you reduce the vacuum drop that's induced, you increase the claw vacuum, you increase the milking speed. And when you start to get a liner that's tired, and done over its two and a half thousand milkings, we start to see the reduction in flow rates. So it doesn't hit the flow rate that we expect to see. So we finished off with, I did say that one part of the equation we shouldn't ever forget is the cow. 
we want faster cows. So if we want a cow that's fast and is ready to milk, we need a cow that is stimulated. She needs to be ready to milk and needs to be ready to milk very quickly. And this graph summarizes everything that you need to know about milk stimulation. And if you've ever tried to milk a camel, you will know that they're not the easiest creatures to milk. They require somewhere between two and two and a half minutes of physical teat stimulation before they will let their milk down. And that's because the vast majority of the milk in the camel, in her udder, is in the alveoli. So it's high in the udder, and that's not high because she's got long legs. It's in the top of the udder. You cannot harvest it until you have the milk let down reflex. If you look at a goat, put the cluster on a goat, she doesn't require stimulation because the milk sits in the cistern where the teat attaches to the udder. She's good to go. Why it's relevant is because the dairy cow is more like a camel than she is a goat. She needs stimulation. You have to treat yourself to new one of these. It's getting tired. This next couple of slides should, be not, should not be new to anybody in this room. And this is talking about milk letdown, milk stimulation, and oxytocin. And if you look at the conditioned reflex, so that's the oxytocin that's produced from learnt behaviour, so from coming into the parlour, hearing the radio, <coughs> hearing the feed arriving, all of that is good and useful and helpful. But if we want all of the available oxytocin, we need non-conditioned or non-learnt milk letdown reflex. And there's probably about 20% additional oxytocin from physical teat stimulation. So if we can put more oxytocin into the system, we get more milk out the other more quickly. And what we need to avoid is bimodality. And this is where we get this two-stage milk letdown. So we have the first part of milk, which is the cisternal milk. Then we have a dead period where nothing's happening. And then we start to get the alveolar milk and the full milk letdown. Now remember, we're trying to improve efficiency by reducing cups on time. Unit on time is one driver of that. We've probably got 40 seconds of dead time there before the commencement of milk letdown where nothing is happening. That, to me, is dead time. But in fact, it's not strictly true to say nothing's happening because at that point, we actually are over-milking the cow. So there's quite a lot happening, but none of it is positive. And this is what we're looking to see, is milk flow curves from the same cow at consecutive milkings that you can superimpose one on the other. They're consistent, they're similar, they're good milk letdown curves. As opposed to this, same cow, three successive milkings, the blue curve is markedly different. Different person milking, different <coughs> routine, different stimulation. So we need to be interested in this. So we're looking to avoid this bimodality. Bimodality is nothing but problematic. So the cow needs to be well stimulated, and we want the end of the cisternal milk to coincide with the arrival of the alveolar milk. So it's balancing that time from stimulating to cluster attachment. And it will vary a little bit depending on stage of lactation, but if we don't get it right, we will have inefficient milking and we will also increase the vacuum early on in the milking process. And the key rule of thumb is to aim for a minimum of 60 seconds from preparation to attachment. Now there has been, uh, there have been people stating previously that you can quite happily, if you put it on not less than 60 seconds, that's great, but it must be within 90 seconds because otherwise somehow this cow is going to explode. There's a lot of data and a lot of research being done in the last two to three years which suggests as long as it's not less than 60 seconds, there's little adverse effect from going beyond a couple of minutes. So if you prep a cow and you leave her for two minutes before you reattach, that's not an issue. If you prep a cow and leave her for 40 seconds, that is an issue. So we think about optimizing the milking system. So we've got the three things to think about. We've got the routine, we've got the machine, we've got the cow. Everything we have to do, we have to try and do efficiently, but at the same time, we have to try and do it with this idyllic view 
of, of this optimum situation, this perfect situation, where we're achieving all of those parameters. So, so can we have it all? So can we have high throughputs? Can we have excellent milk quality? And can we have superb teak condition? Now, I would just throw this in as a, as a final comment that I think we can get most of it. But I don't think we can get it all. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. Um, really appreciate that talk. Um, you're open for a few questions, maybe, Ian? Is that Certainly. okay? So, are there any questions for Ian on that uh, presentation um, for now? Or have you exhausted? After lunch, isn't it? Yeah, no, no, no. Yes, we, yeah, please. Can you just wait for the microphone there? It'll just come down towards you now. Thank you. Can you just repeat the question, Ian? To, uh, I don't think the microphone was quite on. Yeah, I mean, the, the question was basically, how, how do you square this lag of 60 seconds from preparation to attachment in the light of what they do in New Zealand? Um, all I would say is the New Zealand situation is changing, uh, and we are now seeing increasing number of farms in New Zealand actually using teat preparation. The, the argument in the past had been based on a couple of pieces of work that we're looking at comparing European heifers with Kiwi heifers. And the argument was that they've almost bred out the need for stimulation within New Zealand because they haven't, they haven't got the time to stimulate a cow. Dairy NZ have just finished three really interesting pieces of work that would possibly challenge that. And they are showing that, that Kiwi cows that are prepped and left will produce higher milk flow rates than them that are not stimulated. So I think there is, times are changing. Now, there, there's a hardcore of Kiwi dairy farmers that you will never change. Um, and they, they won't embrace teat preparation. But, but we are seeing more of it. But I think there's also, there's no doubt that when you look at, you look over the years at the particularly genetics from New Zealand, that they do have less of a requirement for stimulation. They will milk acceptably. I would just suggest that they might milk more acceptably with some stimulation. <laughs> Not camels. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other questions for Ian uh, before we move on? Yes, please. Cobus. Good man. I just wanted to know if you truncate like they do, do you lose any milk? No. Now, bear, bear in mind, this, that, and that comment has to be taken with a caveat that that was work done in New Zealand on what we would consider to be lower-yielding cows. But in they, they it, showed no reduction in milk yield. Any idea what the production level was when they were truncated? They were doing it, uh, they were doing it on 25-litre cows, 25 litres per day. But at 25, or would, yeah. in other words, was it later lactation cows? No, they were doing on peak, peak, on peak. peak yield cows. Which okay. is, but, but they've gone down, in New Zealand, some of the farms now are applying max T at 80%. Now, I, I haven't got the courage or the conviction to, to apply it at that extent. They're at 80%, they're showing no yield reduction. Can I ask another question? Please do. I just want to understand that. What's happening to the milk? Because you're not extracting the milk, so. Correct. So yeah, where is it? But, but the argument would be, if you look at a milk flow curve, the major I mean, if you look at a, a cow that's milking well, she should give more than 50% of her milk in the first two minutes. I mean, that's a, that's a really good indicator of a well-stimulated cow, is 50% is in the first two minutes. So if you follow that logic through, when you get towards four or five minutes, you're not talking about 30 or 40% okay. of the yield that's left. Just think about the shape of the curve. Thank you. Good question. Thanks, Cobus. 
Uh, any other questions for, for Ian? Okay. Oh, yeah, just towards the back here. Sorry, I can't see your face. Thanks, Gareth. Ian. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and the, putting the ACR settings up, you can, um, if you did it, start it off very low, and it's the same as your fixed time milking, you up, you know, for uh, over a period of time. Yep. Don't you think, there's, I know two herds in the States that are doing this fixed time milking, where they start off by putting the ACR settings up, and they just go in up and up and up, and in the end, just put it on fixed time milking. Yep. Yeah, it's a good. Um, uh, the trouble we're we're as usual just slightly behind the pinball here, aren't we? We're just we're looking at the work that's being done elsewhere, and thinking actually is this something now we can apply in the UK? Other countries, you say the states are picking it up, New Zealand are running with it, so it, it's actually how you implement it, isn't it? And it, and you look at some of the the, the herds in the U US, you know there. I was on a, a a farm not that long ago that had its three times a day milk, and they had their settings at what was 2.4 pounds, which I don't understand why when they can put a man on the moon they can't do things in kilograms, <laughs> but, but that's 1.1 kilogram takeoffs with a three second delay. Now that's pretty, pretty full on takeoffs. Now in that situation, they would probably get exactly the same effect by just applying maximum unit on time. Good, thank you very much indeed. I thought that was a question, but it was just a stretch there going on, I think. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that. Okay, right. Th Ian, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for uh, being here this afternoon. Thank you.